Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Please be seated. Good morning. I know most of you well, but for the few of you that might not know me, my name is John Roney. I'm a parishioner here at St. Paul's. And I'm participating in a program to create licensed lay preachers that's being done through the diocese. It's a two-year program, and uh, this is my second sermon. I gave one three weeks ago up at St. James in Pulaski. And Bridget McManus is my mentor, and that's why she's here with us today. And I'm thankful that our interim rector, Georgina, and Bridget could make this clergy swap so that I could be here with you good people today. Let me tell you that I'm humbled by this whole process. I'm grateful for everyone who's involved, and I'm a little bit nervous. So, today we're introduced to Esau and Jacob. This is a colorful story, in some ways literally. Neither Jacob or Esau are particularly endearing characters. Early in the story, we find them fighting each other in the womb. These two boys were a picture of trouble from the very beginning. They had a classic clash between the impulsive and the practical, the active and the thinker, the bold and the careful, the doer and the schemer. As we find out a bit later, the story ends with Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, and Esau, the father of Edom. Even these great nations have histories of conflict. We start by learning that Rebecca is barren, and after a long wait in Isaac's persistent prayer, Rebecca becomes pregnant. However, all is not well. She is aware of a struggle within her. Jacob and Esau's conflicts in her womb are so eventful that she prays, why do I live? And this had to be particularly troubling because she knows that the fulfillment of the covenant depends on her having a child. In the midst of all this, God tells her that she is carrying the fathers of two nations the young, that they will be in conflict, one's going to be stronger than the other, and the elder will serve the younger. That had to be a lot to take in. Esau is born first, hairy and red. Jacob comes right behind him, grabbing his heel. At the very moment of birth, he's trying to get something. With his first breath, he's showing his scrappy determination. He continues his tenacity for much of his life, much like the people he will someday lead. After they've grown a bit, I imagine them to be in their late teens. We learn that Esau is the outdoors type, athletic, a hunter. Jacob preferred to be indoors. He isn't terribly physical. Pursues, pursues pursuits of the mind. A favoritism that can be common in families develops. As a father might admire a sturdy son, Isaac is partial to Esau. Rebecca has double the incentive for choosing one over the other. First, God tells her the younger will be dominant and she has an affection for a thinker. Now, after Esau comes in the fields one day, Jacob is cooking some lentil stew. We're told Esau is really hungry, and he's certainly impulsive. He asks Jacob for some. Come on, I've been out all day. I'm dying over here. Give me some stew. Esau was so hungry, he could hardly see straight. Jacob, 
seemingly without batting an eyelash, so quickly that maybe he had already thought this through, comes back with an outlandish request. I'll give you some for your birthright. And then, ridiculously enough, Esau agrees. Just to cement the deal, later on in Genesis, Rebekah conspires with Jacob to trick Isaac into giving Jacob Esau's rightful blessing and birthright again. Now after Jacob gets the birthright, he and Esau part for many years. And there are some more shenanigans with other families, other family members. They both get married, start to make a good living for themselves, and become wealthy. When Jacob is in the step of moving back to where they grew up, he hears that Esau is coming to meet him. And Jacob is very apprehensive about this. He assumes that Esau will still be angry about what happened. Will he try to take back his birthright? Will he try to hurt Jacob? Will he try to kill Jacob? None of this happens. And to Jacob's great surprise, Esau greets him with an embrace. After this re reconciliation, God renames Jacob Israel, and he becomes the patriarch of the 12 tribes. Esau becomes the patriarch of Edom. They both end up doing well and have many descendants. Despite the differences between Jacob and Esau and the imperfect job their parents do, God works God's will for both of them. Despite the differences between our family members and the imperfect jobs we may do with them, God works God's will for us too. I'm the firstborn of three, some of you have met my sisters. We were born in Little Rock, Arkansas, and we're all 11 months apart. Some people lovingly call us Irish triplets. We moved to Syracuse when I wasn't quite three years old, largely because my father didn't care for my mother's family. Go figure. I have grown to sympathize with my mother as I imagine her transplanted from her hometown with three kids under the age of three, all in diapers. Not so much unlike Rebecca, far away from home and family, trying to raise her kids as best she can. And in the interest of full disclosure, even though I was the firstborn, from my mother's viewpoint, I kind of felt like a Jacob character. One of my sisters, on the other hand, and I won't name names, I'm pretty sure she could see herself as Esau. Growing up, my sisters and I sometimes fought like cats and dogs over seemingly meaningless things. Who gets to pick the TV channel, cleaning up after dinner, what music to listen to. When we got a little older, we quarrel over who got to use the car. I vaguely remember some words leaving my lips like, um, yeah, I know you had plans for the car tonight, but I have the keys and I grabbed them first thing this morning. So, success on who got to take the car required a little zeal and a little scheming. And because my sisters were so close in age, they could at times have some serious issues of rivalry. They really came on strong during adolescence. That hyper self-aware time is always tough, but I think it's even more so for girls. When it came time to go to college, we all ended up in the same place at roughly the same time. 
it was there that we really started to grow more close. There really was no aha moment of reconciliation. Rather, I think being together in a small North Country college town outside of the security of our home drew us towards each other. My sisters ended up sharing an apartment off campus and we had a shared circle of friends. Some of those friends are with us to this day. And I can confidently say that we all have very fond memories of those times. After college, we all ended up living in different places and a few years later, we all ended up back here in Syracuse. This town has kind of a, a pull that way. Our lives began to parallel and we all worked in the restaurant business and a little later than usual, we became teachers and as it happens in the same district. We bought houses near each other. My sisters had their first kids within months of each other. And today we have relationships that are no, by no means perfect. We still argue, push each other's buttons as only siblings can do, hurt each other's feelings from time to time. But I truly cherish my relationship with these women, my sisters, more than ever. And as I grow older, I'm more and more aware of God's presence through the Holy Spirit that led us to being so close in age and now close in love and spirit. We know as well that Jacob and Esau finally reconciled and that whatever they put each other through, they both became the fathers of great nations. Isaac's family at times looks a lot like our own. Dysfunction, rivalry, deceit, ambition, favoritism, conflict, anger, estrangement. I've had some of these issues in my own family and maybe you've had them in yours. Maybe in some ways it might even look a little like our church family. There's a strong sense of care and love and commitment to each other here at St. Paul's. And I also know we don't always treat each other in the ways that we would be proud of. We know that God loves Isaac's whole family and we know he loves our families, including our church family, as imperfect as we are broken and flawed. And if God can be God for Isaac and his family, he can certainly be God for us. And if God can be in the middle of this herdsman and his messy, devoted family, then God can certainly be in the midst of of our sometimes difficult, always blessed families. And God can be, is, in our midst, through our sometimes challenging, but more often, steadfast church family. Pulling us to a better day, right here, in this place, right now. Amen.